Hi, my name is Gat, but you can also call me Gatsby. And did you know? I really like making cringy OCs. What started out as a simple exercise to put myself out there more creatively has kind of blossomed into a series of videos that not only has been a fulfilling project to me, but a video series that a lot of you watching uh, have seemed to really enjoy. So it's Back to the laugh again. real quick for those of you coming across my channel for the first time with this video, you may be asking yourself, what is a laugh? Laugh, aka Liminal Lost and Found, is this original story concept I have that's been the jumping off point for making all the cringy OCs seen in the series thus far. The short version is that there's this weird pocket dimension called the Liminal, which is just my own take on the back rooms and various characters from across the multiverse have the chance of just randomly phasing in there without any warning. Over the years, a small group of these people who got plopped into the liminal came together and established a small community called Little Town. And from there, a lot of crazy things happened. Like I said before, that's just the short version. So if you want more information about Laugh and the characters and overall context for some of the stuff I'll be talking about in this video, and I've already made a playlist for all the previous, uh, you know, designing, making cringe OCs, and I would really recommend checking out the previous videos via said playlist so you understand what the hell I'm talking about in this video, so... Smile! With all that out of the way, it's time to get liminal. The first character we have in today's video is a special one. For a long time now, I have wanted to have a superhero character in Laugh. Someone who is very powerful, who can beat up the rare occasional scary monster that might get a bit too close to Little Town for comfort. The thing is, is that I didn't know exactly how I wanted this character to be like, both in personality and in design, but it was a good friend of mine, Hank, that would give me the idea of this character. That being... MAN! So thank you so much, Hank. You were a real one. Now about... MAN! What's his deal? How did my friend Hank kick off his creation? Well, it all started when he showed me, and at least one other friend of ours, this video reading off the post of the subreddit r slash Arkham, which is its own rabbit hole, but if you know, you know. After watching the video, we couldn't stop quoting some of the posts from the subreddit and just laughing about it. And then Hank was like, what if there was a character in Laugh who was a superhero who ended up in the liminal, got a real bad case of liminal sickness, and forgot who he was and what he was fighting for. So now his name is just... MAN! And the pause there is intentional, because something used to be there, he just doesn't know what it was. That was another thing that was Hank's idea, so once again, thank you Hank for these absolute bangers. I also know I've started this like weird trend in my own brain where I refer to him as man, 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 as some weird form of ADHD vocal stimming. As for his character design, a lot of it was inspired by public domain superheroes. And there's this whole wiki dedicated to this and the archiving of these characters. I really recommend checking it out if you're interested. A lot of his inspirations uh, include Fireman, Superguy, Atoman, and Atomic Thunderbolt. Though in his rough draft, like beta designs I have right here on screen, there was definitely a strong uh, Space Ghost influence. 
Personality wise, he definitely fits into that trope of strong but stupid characters who might end up doing more harm than good, but they are still lovable. Very Kronk energies in the case of man. Though I think there is a layer of misplaced nostalgia in him. Like he has this nostalgia and longing for this period in his life he can't even remember and often tries to recapture those feelings or memories but failing to do so. Maybe a, a bit of a glory hog because of that. I also want to take the time to kind of explain what liminal sickness is and it's well a sickness you get in the liminal more specifically when you first get in the liminal and not everyone can get it or not everyone gets it it's kind of like a chance thing but if you do get it symptoms can range from nausea and headaches and feelings akin to jet lag and in severe cases some levels of amnesia and though most of the time if somebody does end up with the uh, amnesia they can slowly regain those lost memories but in the case of, well, man, those memories are still very much locked away. I think because of him having liminal sickness and just him being like this buff superhero guy, another character of mine named Levka would really look up to him. For those who don't know, uh, Levka also suffers from liminal sickness, specifically the amnesia part of it. Not as severe as men's, though, but enough where it kind of hinders him a bit. So yeah, Levka really looks up to man and thinks he's the bee's knees and kind of sees him as the shining example of masculinity, which might say a lot about Levka, but we're not going to worry about that right now. <laughs> Another character of mine, Azure, would not like him because he reminds her too much of her own past, which once again is its own rabbit hole. So uh, let's not worry about that. The second character we have in today's video is Mako. And even though she is the second character here that I am drawing, she was actually the last character I drew out of all of them when I was recording footage for this video. Just because her design and her character, it took me a bit to bring it all together, if that makes sense. I was definitely struggling with wanting to make a character that people would think is cool, but I had to remind myself that the whole entire point of this video series is that this is all for me. These characters are supposed to be ones I enjoy, ones I think are neat, and ones that I am interested in and not to withhold my ideas out of fear of being ridiculed. Even though I am cringe, I am free. So I wanted another character who was on the same level of fighting prowess as... Man! Forming basically an A-team to Daisy's, Levka's, Volpez's, and Azure's Team B. And originally, I had the idea of... Mako being like a ninja or a samurai, but then it occurred to me that, you know, ronin, aka samurais that don't serve a master, the word ronin can be translated as wanderer or like wandering. For those that don't know, I like to use that word wander or wanderer to describe those who end up in the liminal. Because once you end up in the liminal, not only do you have to wander about all over the place, but you also kind of wonder 
what the hell is going on? Ha ha ha, I am so smart wordplay. Though, more seriously, I'm not sure in her current position she would be considered a true ronin. Because she's staying in one place, and although she doesn't serve a specific person, she basically serves, like, the whole population of Little Town by protecting them if needed. But she was at least, you know, a ronin in her younger days before she entered the liminal. Speaking of which, I like to think Mako's, like, her whole entire backstory was, well, obviously she was living in, like, Edo-era Japan, but in the more, like, fantasy version of Edo-era Japan, like the ones you see in, like, Inuasha or Dororo, you know, with all, like, the magic and yokai running around causing mayhem. And in Mako's case, I think that her dad was a ronin. Growing up, she would travel with him and he would teach her you know the ways of the sword yada yada and then when she's like a teenager young teenager he gets taken out by some like jerk samurai and she's only left with his swords to remember him by so she goes on a war path on a revenge path and almost ends up destroying herself along the way but before she can do that, she ends up in the liminal. And at this point in her life, she's now in her like late teens, early 20s, right? And she was already in a low point mentally. So being plopped into the liminal and seeing all this weird stuff doesn't really help her mental state. And she kind of eventually ends up getting really close to Little Town. And this causes all the people who were living in Little Town at the time to like kind of gather on the outskirts of Little Town. And then she sees this crowd of like these people really strange to her in ways that she's not familiar with. And she's like, oh my gosh, these are like demons or some shit. So she's on the defensive and now she has her weapons drawn. And then the people in Little Town are now scared because there's this ominous figure on the outskirts of town uh, staring them down with weapons drawn. Things seem like they are not going to end well for anybody. But then, you know, from the crowd that has gathered on the outskirts of Little Town, a, a tiny little pony wiggles her way out of the crowd and walks up to Mako and is able to kind of talk Mako down, help her chill out, and uh, get everybody on good terms. And this little pony being a much younger Daisy Dawnlight. And this whole entire interaction is actually how Daisy gets her cutie mark. Though Daisy doesn't know it's called that or really what it means. As she hasn't grown up around others of her kind. So skip forward like years later to more of like the present to more of where the story of Laugh takes place. Mako is now like in her late 20s, early 30s, and is kind of like an older sister figure to not only Daisy, but to a lot of, of others who live in Little Town. And her time in the liminal and in Little Town has really benefited her mental health. It's given her a new purpose. It's helped her move on and grow past her previous trauma and just overall heal, you know? And design-wise, if it wasn't obvious, if you look at her, you can definitely see she was uh, inspired by iconic Ghibli women like Lady Eboshi and Lin Lin, and even a bit of Jessie from Team Rocket. And even her name was kind of named in honor of one of my favorite Vocaloids, Mako. And there's also this uh, coincidence with the name Mako that depending on what characters you use to write the name down, um, Meko can be translated to mean something like lost child, which, I mean, come on, liminal lost and found. I just couldn't pass up on that kind of coincidence, that opportunity. Overall, I'm really glad I went with drawing and creating a character 
that goes with what I want to see, what I think would be cool, as opposed to what I think others would want. Because, you know, art, art stuff like this, this is for me. This is all for me. And even if I am cringe, I am free. When it comes to Liminal Lost and Found and creating characters for it, I've come to notice something. Most of the characters so far are extremely humanoid. And in a story where pretty much anything is possible, I wanted to try and create characters that deviated from the, the typical humanoid body plan. The thing is, though, this idea went in a different direction than what I had originally planned. At first, I wanted to make this one weird little guy, just this little freaky guy who did funny little freaky things, and I wanted to call him Splargo, because I thought that was a really funny word to say, Splargo. So I doodled some concepts for Splargo, but I wasn't really sure on the vibe of any of them. So I sent these doodles to my friends to get their opinion. And I think it was one of my friends, Dungeon, and he pointed out that all these like little designs for Splargo, that it reminded him of Wee Wee's. You know, the little plush toys made by the company Item Label. And then I quickly became enamored by the idea that instead of Splargo being like one singular weird little guy, to it being Splargos, these weird little creatures. Are they pets? Are they pests? Who knows? I think that's kind of a person-to-person -person diagnostic thing when it comes to Splargos. I will say that in my mind, they are definitely scavengers. They get into anything they can just to get any crumb, any s small amount of food. However, I don't think they're very intelligent creatures. I see them very easily getting stuck in things like paper bags and then them getting like really like scared and confused and just like kind of giving up <laughs> on life when they get stuck in like little paper bags. They definitely fall in that gray area of either being like cute or disgusting. The final thing I want to say about Splargos though is that when it comes to like the coloration they have, I only used colors that can be found within a Zorn color palette. Now, what's a Zorn color palette? Well, there was this Swedish painter named Ander Anders Zorn, right? Who only painted with a few colors, this being like a red, a black, a white, and like a yellow ochre. So those colors and any colors you can get from mixing those colors, those make up a Zorn color palette. And all those colors you can see from that color palette, those are all valid uh, Splargo colors. Apologies to my purple enjoyers out there. There are no purple Splargos. Continuing on with the little trend I have here of trying to create more non-humanoid designs, we have Quilton, and he's, well, a quilt. A sentient quilt. And kinda a mean one at that. An upfront jerk, unlike other characters of mine like Volpez, who tries to hide behind a layer of sociability with his assholery, Quilton will just tell you up front how he feels about you, and it's usually not very nice. And there's an irony there because of how quilts and blankets in general are usually associated with comfort and warmth, having this very just, just mean guy just be like this sentient blanket, I think is really funny. Design-wise, there's definitely uh, the DNA of the Muppets and also similar puppets like the Muppets. I feel like if I had the, the ability to like make a 
like cartoon or movie of laugh if Quilton was in it he'd have to be like a puppet of some type if that makes sense and then also the Pokemon Mimikyu both of them being these beings of dark shadowy ominous creatures that hide beneath a fabric like I said his personality you know he's just kind of a jackass but he's also an introvert. He likes to keep to himself and read. And because of this, he ends up becoming the librarian of the Little Town Library. That's right, Little Town has a library. Books, you know, I think are fairly important within Liminal Lost and Found. I mean, of course, there's always the saying, knowledge is power, but I think a lot of the power that comes from books and other similar mediums like VHS tapes, DVDs, CDs, cassette tapes, all that jazz, is that it provides an escapism, a relief from the horrors of being in the liminal. Especially if you're lucky enough to get uh, some type of medium that is either from your home dimension or something that reminds you of your home dimension. This, uh, however, brings up an important lore tidbit I want to bring up with Laugh, and that is when it comes to liminal lost and found and language. You know, we have all these characters from different universes, different like periods of time. How can they all communicate and understand each other? Because if you think about it, they should all be speaking different languages, and they do. They, they really do. So in my mind, how it works is, is that in the liminal, there's this kind of like a built-in universal translator for spoken language in real time. So basically when people are talking to each other, they hear what the other person is saying like in their own mother tongue, if that makes sense. For example, Mayor Murphy, her first language is English. So to her, everyone sounds like they're speaking English. But for someone like Meiko, whose first language is Japanese, to her, it sounds like everyone's speaking Japanese. This, like I said, only goes so far um, when it comes to the universal translator stuff. Like it's, it's mainly just for like spoken language, like written text. If you can't understand what's written down, then you're gonna have to learn what it what it reads out. And I don't think like recorded audio counts for this either. So if you find like a CD that's in a language you don't know, you're not gonna really understand what the singer is singing about unless you have like some type of translation to figure that out. And I think it's because of stuff like that, that Quilton has a very important role in Little Town. Not only is he, you know, the keeper of all this knowledge, but he's also like the keeper of this form of relief and escapism. And it's a very important job and it's a very difficult job because he has to like, like once he gets these materials, he has to kind of like analyze and organize them by like implied or guest category, but also potential guest language. Like, oh, this book and this video game, they look like they're written in a similar language. Should I kind of have them organized by each other? That kind of thing. And I think Quilton, you know, like I said, he takes this job very seriously and would definitely be the type of librarian who is the stereotypical librarian, you know, who's always telling you to shush your mouth and be quiet. Definitely the type of librarian who takes due dates of rented items very seriously and is not going to be very happy with you if you bring your books in late. And I fear what he does to those poor souls who forget to bring in their books and other items from the library in on time. Last but not least, we have the final character for today's video, and that is Nova. Yes, I'm kind of going back on my previous words about wanting to have 
more non-humanoid characters for laugh. But in the case of Nova, she is a character that I think that not only really fits in the world of Liminal Lost and Found, but I think also deserves to be in the story because, well, she's a character I made years ago that I only drew once and never really thought of again. This ended up happening because Nova was a byproduct of me trying to come up by me trying to come up with a design for the collector another oc who's been kind of repurposed for this story that's right when i was trying to design the collector i came up with nova's design first it wasn't the direction i wanted to go with for the collector but i liked what i came up with so much that I gave her a name, named her Nova, saved the art, and never did anything with her ever again. So, Nova, I'm so sorry for all the years of neglect and not paying attention to you. Here's your time to shine. The only real character idea I had for Nova when I first created her is that she was some type of like pop idol or singer. And I really liked that idea, so I kind of wanted to redesign her a bit and push more of that idea with her new look. And that with her kind of star space theme going on, I like to think she was an upcoming, rising to fame, pop idol on a intergalactic level. Like in some like space sci-fi world before she ended up in the liminal. And she ended up in the liminal right when she was kind of like starting her rise to popularity, rise to fame. So she was sitting in like the changing room waiting for her next performance to start and she just ended up getting plopped into the liminal. And now that she's in the liminal, she really doesn't know what to do with herself and she's really lacking any form of structure to her life really lacking any of the comforts and joy she had in her life before she ended up in the liminal. Basically, I think she ends up a little depressed and kinda in a creative block. And I think these issues of hers are kinda intensified because outside of the three characters of Volpez, Lefka, and Azure, Nova is the newest inhabitant of Littletown, having only been in the liminal for about six months, maybe a year. She's still not very used to the liminal and finds herself extremely lonely, having really no one around her age to talk to or hang out with, as she's about 19 to 20 years old. The person closest to her in age, or rather Pony, is Daisy, who's about 21. And the two actually became pretty close and pretty good friends when Nova first, you know, showed up in the liminal and the two really enjoyed spending time together. But when Volpez and Lefka and eventually Azure joined Little Town, Daisy becomes really fixated, really focused on wanting to spend time with the three of them and go on epic liminal exploration adventures and doesn't really take the time to still hang out with Nova who prefers to stay in the little town where she feels safe. It's kind of like that one clip from Fairly Odd Parents. You know the one. You're my new best friend. <laughs> so yeah, Nova is this sad and lonely young lady who feels like she has no one really to talk to very isolated, and I like to think that in the story of Laugh, uh, this whole situation of Daisy basically shafting her aside for her other friends would be pointed out, and Daisy sees the errors of her ways, uh, you know, apologizes to Nova, and starts being a better friend to Nova, and Nova is eventually able to kind of get out of her funk, get out of her shell, and get back into music like she really uh, enjoys. She 
loves her music. She loves to sing. Smile. And that's it for this video and this batch of characters. I had a lot of fun this time around like I usually do, but especially with characters like the Splargos and Quilton, uh, making more abstract out of their character designs. But who was uh, your favorite character in this video? Any other Liminal Lost and Found related comments or questions? Feel free to put them down below. I always really enjoy reading what you all have to say. It's, it's definitely one of those things that really do keep me motivated and excited to do more videos like these. So thank you so much if you got this far in the video. Until next time, stay safe, be kind to one another, and bye bye